Good? Are we getting started? Yep. All right, we're supposed to start at 1045, right? I think? Yeah? Yeah. Right, we got to get going. It's 1047. I got a lot of stuff to cover. So cool. Thanks for um, coming to my talk today. Those of you guys who voted online in advance, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Dan Olson. I'm going to be sharing some advice from my book, The Only Product Playbook, on how to achieve product market fit. Um, real quick about my background so you guys know where I'm coming from. I started out with an engineering background. Um, and uh, I moved out here to Silicon Valley a while ago to go to business school. And that's where I discovered product management as a career choice. I said, that sounds awesome. That's what I want to do. And I asked people, where's the best place to learn product management? And they fit into it. So I, I was fortunate to get a job at Intuit. Um, shortly after working in product management, I realized, gosh, UX design is really important. So I made it a point to learn a lot about UX design. I actually proposed a session for the afternoon on UX design, because I think it's helpful for PMs to know about that. Um, and uh, after into it, I basically worked at startups as a product leader. I've also been, a, you know, I wanted to start my own company. I did that back in 2009 for a few years. And what I do now is I consult and help companies out. I've been doing that for nine years. I helped Box as a client back in the day, other companies. Um, and I also am a big believer in sharing best practices. So I've been, for four years now, I've been running a meetup group in Mountain View um, where I bring in top speakers called Lean Product Lean UX Meetup. Um, we have over 6,500 members. And you can reach me on Twitter at Dan Olson. And I post all my slides, videos, and slides at uh, my website, dan-olson.com. Um, and some people ask me, well, why is it called the Lean Product Playbook? And part of it is just because there's a big overlap between product management and Lean Startup in my mind. Right? I've spoken at the Lean Startup Conference a bunch of times. When I go there, most of the people I meet are product managers because we're the ones who are responsible for product market fit. So I think Lean Startup has given us a lot of concepts and ideas that are very helpful to us. Um, one of those is product market fit, and anytime you have a new um, um, like movement like Lean Startup, there's always like buzzwords that people have, like pivot, MVP, product market fit. Product market fit, people actually talk about pretty simplistically. They'll be like, oh, Box succeeded because they had product market fit. Startup X, they failed because they did not have product market fit. So they talk about like this true or false thing, um, but there's not a lot of guidance on how to, how to achieve it. So that's basically why I wrote the book. And I just want to share a quick story of one time we tried to achieve our market fit where it didn't quite go so well. Um, we went out and we talked to customers to understand what they wanted. That's what they told us. That's how they described it to us. Um, this is how the product manager envisioned the product. This is what was uh, ready for the alpha version. And it wasn't quite right, but we fixed it in the beta. It got definitely better in the beta. This is what marketing advertised. Uh, this is what was actually ready by the original launch date that we thought we were going to have. This is what the press had to say about it, and this is what the customer really wanted. So, anyway, it's just a funny cartoon to illustrate like we're playing this game, guessing game, trying to figure out what's going to make customers happy when we're trying to achieve product market fit. And there, like I said, there's not a lot of guidance out there on that, so that's why I wrote the book, um, the Lean Product Playbook. I'm actually going to give a copy away. The way you win is just tweet at Dan Olson, and I'll um, go through the tweets later and I'll give it out. Um, I'm also wrapping one off later today. And you know, if there's a slide that you like, you can take a photo of that. If you want to throw a hashtag, or the hashtag for Product Camp is SVP Camp. Um, and you can throw in Product Management and start if you want to. But the core, um, the core framework in the book is a Product Market Fit Pyramid. And um, having an engineering background, if I'm going to try to achieve Product Market Fit, I want to have like a rigorous kind of framework that I can get my head around. So this is the framework that I created. It's got five layers. The bottom two layers are... Uh, the bottom two layers are the market layers. So it all starts with the target customer, like whose life are we trying to make better? Who are we trying to create value for? Um, and the next layer up is for that customer, what are their underserved needs? And we'll talk about the word underserved more. But the idea is like a real pyramid where the layers build on top of each other. So whose needs are we talking about? It's the target customer we're talking about. And like a real pyramid, if we change this layer, then everything above it can come crashing down and we need to, to uh, you know, start from scratch again, basically. So that's the market, and you know you don't actually control the market. You can pick what market you want to target and go after, but you don't control them, right? And uh, you know any marketing or economics textbook will say um, a market is just a group of people that share a set of common needs. So that's the market. Where you do what you do control, and where you make decisions and hypotheses and execution is in the product layers. And I like to think about them in these three layers: your value proposition, which ideally builds on top of the underserved needs. And is okay, um, which needs are we going to actually tell customers that we deliver on, and how are we going to be better or different than the other products that are out there? That's where product strategy lives. The next layer up is feature set. So, what's the functionality that's actually going to convey those benefits to the customer? And then finally, user experience. That brings, brings the functionality to life, what the user actually interacts with. Right? 
And when you have it, when you see this, you realize you're making all these decisions and execution up here. Product market fit is just how well does all that execution are doing up there? How well does it resonate with the market? That's product market fit. And once I had this framework, I realized I can create a process. This is just a set of hypotheses that you need to get right enough. The idea here is if you get your target customer right enough, and you get their underserved needs right enough, and you get the value prop right enough, and the feature set right enough, and the UX right enough, then you'll have product market fit. So it's like this big and of these five things. So the lean product process just guides you through from the bottom of the pyramid up, getting clear on those hypotheses and testing them basically. So it starts with step one, who's our target customer? Step two, what are their underserved needs? Step three, what's our value prop? How are we going to be better or different? Right. What's our feature set? And I forgot to mention, this is where MVP comes in. We don't want to over scope and over build before we realize whether we're going in the right direction or not. And then finally, user experience. Now the cool thing is, I'm a big believer actually of testing these hypotheses without doing any coding, like using interactive prototypes. And so whether it's an interactive prototype or your live product, once you have this UX, it kind of represents all the assumptions and decisions you made up going up the chain. There's a sixth step where we take that UI, whether it's live product or prototype, and we go and we test with customers to see where we're at with product market fit. So that's the six steps of the lean product process I'm going to walk you through today. And we'll close out with an example. And this is meant to be an iterative um, process. Uh, how many of you have heard of build, measure, or learn loop before? All right, so cool. So that, that's a concept from Lean Startup. It's a good concept because it gets people understanding that we're iterating, right? we're going to learn and iterate. But I, the couple things I don't like about it, one, it starts with build. And I just got done telling you we can, we can learn a lot without building. It's actually really expensive to build uh, and then realize you did the wrong thing. And secondly, the word measure sounds very quantitative, like you're measuring some number. And you'll see, as I've talked to you today, especially when you're doing new products, I think it's mainly qualitative learning, not quantitative learning that's going on. I'm not that quantitative is not important. My talk right after this one is going to be all about using analytics to optimize your product. But when you're doing more uh, you know, greenfield, new product, new feature, it's more quantitative. So this is my version of the loop that I like. Hypothesis starts with hypothesize. You form a hypothesis, right? You design a way to test your hypothesis. You test it. You learn from the test, and you revise your hypothesis, and you go to the next iteration. So that's what we're doing as we go through the loop. Um, the first step is determining your target customer. And I should mention, you can use this process for a new product, obviously a new 1.0 product, a 2.0 product, you can use it. You can also use it for a new feature. It doesn't have to be a whole product. If you're adding a new feature to a product, you can get, use this methodology. Uh, and even if there's a product where you haven't used these techniques, you can use it and find ways to increase customer value. Um, if you are doing it for a new product, this can be pretty, you know, you might be like, okay, I'm starting with a blank piece of paper. i got to figure out who my target customer is. There's a lot of uncertainty here. It's probably the most uncertainty in the whole process. So I just want to acknowledge that and say it's okay to start out with a tentative definition because as you move down and iterate to step two, they're so related that basically you're going to be revising and iterating it, right? But I want to show why it's so important um, uh, to, to get really clear because uh, in my experience, there's always this... Uh, a lot of times product teams, you'll have an answer or an idea and it sounds pretty good on the surface, but you realize it's just not deep enough. And I think too, the analogy I always think of is peeling an onion. And so you start out with the outer layer, but you need to peel several layers down. I was uh, talking with a group the other day and I said, hey, who's your target market? And they said to me, oh, it's millennials. And at first that sounds good, it sounds specific. I'm like, okay, cool, they have an answer, right? And then I thought about it, I'm like, well, how many millennials are there out there? There's like millions of millennials. There's got to be some other way we can subdivide this market. And their product had to do with preparing food at home. So they could easily said millennials who aspire or want to uh, you know, prepare food at home. That would have been even more better. So that's what I'm talking about. And what you find is, this happens a lot, whether it's talking about your customer needs, is as you peel the onion, you see that you get more insight and you realize that the detailed needs are different depending on the customer. So I like to use this example to illustrate that. You know, picking a need that a lot of people have, the need for transportation within 100 miles from your home, to get to work, to get to school, to get to the store. This is a need that a lot of people have. That's the outer layer of the onion. We could stay there, and we would probably not really get a lot of product market fit. The second you look through at that need through the lens of a specific customer, you'll see that the details are quite different. Let's take two different customers. One, on the one hand, a soccer mom. She has a need to get around, right? And a speed demon. He has that need to get around. Now, if I went out and did customer discovery interviews with 20 soccer moms, and I said, hey, can you tell me what's important when it comes to transportation? I might hear things like, well, I'm carrying my children and their friends and all their athletic gear, so the car's got to be literally big enough to hold all that stuff. Um, I'm driving my children around. They're super important to me, so safety's on my mind. And I'm doing a lot of driving, so I want to make sure it'd be great if I wasn't spending so much on gas. Those might be the detailed, detailed things that we hear. 
If we interview 20 speed demons, they probably wouldn't bring up any of those things. They'd bring up things like, well, it's important that the car goes really fast and that it looks cool, and most importantly, that I look cool driving down the street, right? And you end up with very different products. They both meet that high level need, but they've been optimized for the detailed needs of that target market. And I like to talk about cars, because think about I don't know, when you guys drove here this morning, think about all the cars that are on the road, right? You got trucks, you got SUVs, you got minivans, you got Coopers, Scions, you got all kinds of stuff, right? <laughs> They've done a good job of really tailoring the product for each of those micro segments. So that's step one. And by the way, personas are a good way to capture that. They're often used later in the UX design stage, but it's a good way to capture um, simple attributes and assumptions and hypotheses at the beginning. So once we have a tentative uh, idea of who our, our customer is, the next step is to identify what do we think their underserved needs are. Right? And when we talk about customer needs, uh, an important concept that I like to share is the idea of problem space versus solution space. Who's heard of problem space before? Some people, cool. So uh, I've been talking about this for a while, so I'm glad to hear more and more people talking about it. Let me explain it real quick. Problem space is basically a customer problem, need, or benefit that the product should address. Uh, it could be a well-written product requirement. It could be a well-written agile user story. Those are all trying to stay in the problem space, right? So like, as a blank, I want a blank so I can blank. That's trying to stay in the problem space. If I said, you know what, I want to create a way to make it easier for people to share photos with their friends, that statement, create an easier way for people to share photos with friends, would be in the problem space. <laughs> if the next thing I said is, yeah, in the last month I quoted an app that does that, that app would be in the solution space. Or if I said, hey, my friend Bill's a designer, he created an awesome set of mock-ups for that app, those mock-ups would be in the solution space. I didn't actually get there, right? So solution space is specific implementation to address the need. And what happens is we live in the solution space, Engineers build in the solution space, so there's this temptation. Most product teams, they just jump right into solution space. It's just, it's just a habit. And good product managers are able to tease apart problem space and solution space, right? The way this plays out on our feature teams is your Jira ticket will say, add a drop down. Is a drop down a solution or a problem? It's a solution, right? Or we say, add a configurator, add a wizard, add this field. Those are all solutions. And if you want a technique to get back to the problem space, it's just the biggest thing is just to ask why. There's a five why technique. You say, oh, why do we need to add a drop down? Oh, we need to give the customer a way to uh, select their address. Well, why don't we write the user story that way? Then maybe the drop down is the best way, maybe it's not. So that's the difference between problem space and solution space. The example I like to use to illustrate this is when NASA was sending astronauts into space, they used ballpoint pens that we use here that rely on gravity, weren't going to work in space, right? And um, it wasn't NASA. NASA didn't do it. One of their contractors said, one said, you know what, I think, and NASA didn't ask him to do it. He said, I think I can invent a pen that will write in space. If you Google this, showing up on some urban legend thing, it'll say NASA didn't spend, didn't spend the money. It wasn't NASA. It was one of the contractors. And they basically, this guy went off and he spent a million dollars on R&D and he invented a space pen. And it writes in space, basically, right? Faced with the same challenge, the Russians gave their astronauts pencils. <laughs> You can actually get a Russian space pen. It's like a joke. It's like a red pencil in a box, like poking fun at the fact, at this fact, right? So why do I bring this up? One, obviously, if these are both equally good solutions to the problem, then the one that didn't take a million dollars and all that money, it's better, right? It's better ROI. The second reason, that's obvious. The second reason I bring it up is even when you're trying to be in the problem space, it's easy for some to get some solution, solution space concepts in there. And I call it solution pollution, basically, right? So when the guy said, hey, I think I can invent a pen that writes in space, he had some solution pollution in his problem space. What was his pollution that he had? Pen, yeah, pen is a solution. He like baked the solution in the problem, right? It would have been better if he just been vague and said a way to write in space. That would, better, would have been better than embedding a solution in the thing. It happens all the time if you think about your chair tickets. People are embedding solutions in user stories. Um, when, when they are really clear on the problem, right? And when somebody recommends a specific solution, it's because in their mind they're, they're making this mental leap and not realizing, oh, I think that's gonna solve this problem. So you wanna decompose that and tear it apart. Um, yeah, so that's basically why I bring up those examples. And it's, it, again, it's, we live in the solution space, it's really easy. Let's talk about more of a software example. So again, we've got problem space on the left, solution space on the right. Um, the idea, general idea is you wanna start in problem space and then uh, explore different solution space ideas. Um, but, you know, I used to work it into it on Quicken. One of our other products is TurboTax. It's a software product, so it's in the solution space. It competes with another product, TurboTaxCut, which is also in the solution space. Now, what we, want to, what we can try to do is try to figure out what, what benefits does it per, deliver for people. Does anyone here use TurboTax? <coughs> it's about that time of year, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they got I you. Tax cut. 
<laughs> so for those of you that use TurboTax, what, what would you say on the problem space? What would you say? Why do you use it? What values or benefits does it give you? Just yell out. Why? It's cheaper and more convenient. Cheaper and more convenient. Got used to it. Right? You got used to it? Easy to use. Easy to use? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> E-file. E-file. Okay. Updates, updates, insights in the same package. Updates, insights, okay. Does all the calculations for you. Does all the calculations for you, yeah. A lot of uh, questions and answers that are available. Not in the product, but... A lot of questions and answers, yeah. So this is, a, that's a, those are all great problems to make statements. Um, you know, E-file sounds like a solution. I could say, well, why is that valuable? Let's just do it. Why is that valuable? Why is E-file valuable? Just so I don't have to go to the post office or print it. Mm -hmm. And why is that valuable? Saves me time. There you go. So I finally got to a benefit. Like, 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 that, like you know, that's the why, the power of the why technique, right? Exactly. So for you, it saved time. Someone else said convenient. Someone else said cheaper, right? The thing is, different customers have different needs and preferences. And we're also not robots or computers. We're not, even if you're talking about the same cheaper benefit, you're going to use different words, right? So it's kind of hard. That's our job, though, as product managers, to make sense of that problem space, right? <coughs> It'd be too easy to say, you know what, how do I make like, how do I make sense of what I just heard? That's too hard, let's just go design and ship something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we want to do is, is really investigate the problem space. That's one of the main things we can do. At a high level, this is like the outer layer of the onion. I would say it's something like, hey, it helps me prepare my taxes, helps me do my taxes. But that is too high level to be actionable. It helps define the category that we're operating in. This is the fun part. Say we were building a new tax product and we said, we can now, as a team, say, what are all the different ways that we can help people with their taxes? And we can brainstorm all the different ways, right? We're not saying we're going to do it, but we're going to brainstorm. Um, oops. The other thing, it, someone who helped me appreciate this, was Scott Cook. Scott Cook was the founder at Intuit. And what he loved to do is, he, if he'd be giving a talk to a set of product, group of product managers, he'd say, who's the biggest competitor for tax for tax? And everyone would say, tax cut. He's like, no, you're wrong. It's pen and paper. Because more Americans were doing their taxes that way, with pen and paper, right? So that's the other thing is, Getting clear on the problem space helps you really understand what are the true comp competitors and substitutes for how people are getting those needs met. So what we want to do is start in the problem space. Again, like I said, brainstorm. We're not saying we're going to do these things. And brainstorm, what are all the different ways we can help people? So if someone said, hey, it does the calculations. Yeah, I can check your taxes. Computers are great at math, right? If you're doing it by hand, you might make some mistakes. It can help you file your taxes, as you said, right? Instead of standing in line at the post office, you can just push a button. It can ask you a bunch of questions, like Q&A, like you were saying, and help you maximize, find things you can write off that you might not have known about. It can help you, you know, analyze your audit risk and say, hey, you might want to consider this. These are just four examples. And what you want to do, now again, I'm not saying we're going to do this, is as a team, brainstorm and explore all the different areas of how you could help people. Right? It's one way to get creative ideas. So I just want to show an onion so you can visualize peeling the onion as a team, right? trying to get more and more details. Now, it is messy, like we just saw. The problem space is messy because people don't say the exact same thing. Um, but you will find that there's some patterns and clusters in there. And so, if, say for example, let's take these three benefits. Help me prepare my taxes, reduce my auto risk, and check my return. If I did the five whys like I just did, I said, well, can you tell me why that's valuable, why? What I'm doing is I'm getting the person to get you know, higher level. Part of why we get different answers is someone can be very specific. Like, I like how it handles Schedule D, very specific. Someone else can say, I like how it makes my life easy. That's way up here in the clouds, right? So by asking why, you kind of get people to kind of go to a higher level. It's like climbing a ladder, so we call these benefit ladders. If I ask people here, it would probably end up with something about empowerment or confidence. The story might go like, well, you know, I have to do my taxes every year. I'm horrible at math. I don't know anything about the tax code. I'm sure I'm doing it wrong. I'm very anxious when I do this. There's a deadline, and gosh, I just hated it. And then now I got TurboTax, and it just holds my hand and asks me question by question. Next thing you know, I'm done, and I feel more confident. That would be an empowerment or confidence story. There could be that, and we call that a benefit ladder. All these three sub-benefits are on that same empowerment ladder, right? Uh, there could be a completely different ladder that has to do with saving time. Saving time preparing, like, hey, the old way it took me five days, it would trophy tax took me two days, uh, and also save time filing, as we were just talking about, right? That's a whole different ladder. It has nothing to do with empowerment or confidence. The third benefit ladder could be save money, right? It's actually saving me money. So what you want to do, this is what I call a problem space definition. You can imagine rotating it 90 degrees. It just didn't lay that weight out on the slide. That's what we as product teams want to come up with, as product managers want to come up with. And these are hypotheses right now, right? But we want to flesh it out and make sense of this so that as a team, we can kind of categorize any idea. Yeah? So ultimately, all these factors boils down to saving money. Do you agree with that? Or no, I don't. No, not at all. Because ultimately, saving time means you're saving money, right? For some people. That may be for you. They may be closely linked, but yeah. 
I mean, uh, when you go to talk with the customer, they ask for what is the ROI. So how am I going to characterize that? B2B customers might be like that. B2C customers may not be like that. So different customers are different, right? So yeah, some people may view it that way. For a lot of people, time is money. So they're, they are related, right? But someone may say, you know what? That gives me more time to be with my kids. It's not about money. It's about the other things, right? It's value. Yeah, it's value, right? These are all, all That's why we're trying to get clear possible is how we're going to create value. And you notice I've been all this time talking about TurboTax without actually mentioning a feature. We did talk about eFile, but we didn't, you know, I'm spending all this time here on the problem space. It turns out, obviously, that they are features. They actually have a feature, TurboTax has a feature that they actually, this map directly. And when you have the, uh, when you have this clear type mapping between this feature solves this problem, and it's well named, you get a side benefit that just by seeing the name of the feature, you can kind of figure out how it's going to create value for you, right? So that's the idea. So what you want to do again is start in the problem space and then brainstorm solution ideas and, and figure out this mapping. Now, if you take quick my question. advice, I'm just hold it for a second. I just want to get through we'll be a little behind. Um, if you take my advice and you end up with like dozens of, you, you know, like you should just go nuts and come up with like dozens of these things and maybe you come up with some crazy other ladder or some other stuff. Um, the next question becomes great. Now that we brainstorm, we can't actually do all these things. We don't have the resources to do all these things. What should we actually do? So you need to prioritize these somehow. Right now it's time to converge and prioritize. And the framework uh, that I like to do, what we say is like, let's prioritize based on how much value it's going to create. That just begs the question, how do we determine how much value it's going to create? And the framework that I developed it to answer that question is importance versus satisfaction. So I want to walk you guys through this. Um, importance is for that need, whether it's saving time or saving money or you know feeling more confident, how important is it? And different people are going to give different answers, right? And you can think of this as a survey. I ask you a survey question on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is it to you? And you might give saving time an 8 out of 10. You might give saving money a 6 out of 10. You might give the opposite scores, right? That's the idea. You can also just use it as a thinking tool. You don't have to be so precise and, and quantitative and statistically significant. You can just be like, hey, on our team, low, medium, high. Do we think people care more about saving money or saving time? We can have that discussion. And then on the horizontal axis, we have how satisfied are people with the current alternatives. Uh, again, low to high, you can imagine a survey, right? With how you're getting that need met today, how satisfied are you? That's, that's basically importance versus satisfaction. This is in the problem space, and this is in the solution space, right? Let's just divide it into the four quadrants so we can talk about these. So in the bottom left quadrant, we have a, a low importance user need uh, and, a low, and low satisfaction with how it's getting met today. Down here in this quadrant, bottom right, we have low importance of user need and high satisfaction. At the end of the day, neither of these are worth going after because it's a low importance need. Right? And nobody does this on purpose. Somebody says, hey, I want to go address a low importance need. They just don't talk to customers and don't validate their hypotheses. And so they don't realize what they thought was important until after they launched it, they realized customers didn't think it was important. In the upper right quadrant, we have a high importance of user needs. So that's better. People are saying, yeah, that's important to me. But they're also highly satisfied with how it's getting met today. Right? So yeah, it's important, but I'm pretty happy with how it's getting met today. That's the definition of a competitive market, basically. Right? And uh, you hear people say you need to be 10x better. This is where you need to be 10x better. I'm not saying you shouldn't go into that, but you should be very clear on how you're going to be better and how you're going to be 10x better, not just 1%, 2%, 5% better. The example I always think of here is like Google internet search. If I said, hey, how important is it to find things you're looking for online? Usually it's pretty important. And if I, but if I said, like, how satisfied are you? It's not like people walk around going, gosh, I can't find anything on Google. It sucks, you know? You pretty much find it. After you have to revise your query or go to page two, you can find it. Right? So that's competitive market. In the upper left quadrant, we have a high importance of user needs, so that's good. And we also have low satisfaction with how they're getting met today, how it's getting met today. That's where opportunities live, is in the upper left quadrant. And they won't be there forever, because everyone else is trying to find opportunities and execute against them too. But if you do this kind of analysis, you will find opportunities that are there. Um, the example uh, you know, that I like to list up in that quadrant, uh, companies like Uber and Lyft have done a lot of things right to be successful, right, as far as execution of product and operations and marketing and things like that. But I think one of the unspoken reasons why they're so successful is because they're fundamentally addressing an upper left quadrant need. If I said to you, hey, how important is it to get to your flight at the airport on time? It's pretty important. If I said, how important is it to get to that interview or that date or that medical appointment? It's pretty important to get where you need to go on time, right? That's a high importance. And certainly in the Bay Area, like not in New York City, but in the Bay Area, if any of you guys ever tried to hail a cab back in the day, you know, you'd call, yeah, okay, a cab will be there in 20 to 30 minutes, and you sit there and wait, and then 30 minutes later, no cab. You call back, I don't know what happened, we'll send you another one, right? So sometimes they don't show up, right? And, you know, not all cab rides, but some of them, you can imagine if we just said, hey, in general, think of the last five cab rides, how satisfied are you on a scale of 1 to 10, right? And we could peel the onion one more and go, well, how satisfied were you with how, how punctual they were in showing up? 
How satisfied were you with how polite the driver was? How satisfied were you with how clean the car was? How easy it was to pay the person? How safe did you feel? We can imagine some low scores. So I think that's why another reason that those companies have been so successful. And what I like about this framework is meant to be a visual framework. So what I'm trying to say is, if there's a certain product represented by that red dot that addresses a need with that level of importance, and it does so with that level of satisfaction, then if you plot it, then what I'm trying to say is the area formed by that rectangle where you plot it is like a proxy for how much customer value it creates. <clears throat> and if there's another product represented by the green dot that addresses a higher importance need with a higher level of satisfaction, then that much more area that it creates is just that much more customer value. And when you see things that way, you realize that, wow, you know, wherever the market is, wherever the best product is, um, the area there is to the right of there, going all the way to like the highest satisfaction, that's the opportunity to create customer value. Right? That's, that's basically uh, a measure of that. So that's why the upper left quadrant offers the biggest opportunity to create customer value. And if you have, say the green dot is your product, you can basically you know, increase customer value by increasing the satisfaction with how it meets that need. So I developed this earlier in my career. Um, if this seems a bit kind of abstract or conceptual, let me show you some real data. So I had a product that had 13 key features that we cared about. So we surveyed, in this case, it's the survey use case, not, the, not just the rough thinking tool. We surveyed thousands of users, so it was significant. And we asked them to rate the importance and satisfaction for each of these 13 features. And here's what we had. So now instead of high, medium, low, we actually have real numbers going up to 100, going up to 100, right? The first thing, each of these dots is one of those 13 key features plotted with its importance and satisfaction. The number next to it is just the satisfaction, so you can see it more easily. Now, the first thing I saw was this one up here. People are telling us it's 100% uh, importance, and we're doing 98% satisfaction. That's pretty good. Like, good job, team. My second thought was, I don't want to spend any of my valuable engineering resources working on that. Let's go find something else that's going to create value, right? And we had a cloud of features in here. We had this one down here. Well, we had this outlier up here. That was the one that was the most up and to the left, right? Relatively high importance, relatively low satisfaction. That offered the biggest opportunity to improve customer value, basically. So we focused on that. And then a few years after I um, left into it, I was excited to come across the book, What Customers Want by Tony Ulrich. And he has his own importance and satisfaction framework. It's pretty similar to mine, some slight differences, but that gave me a lot more confidence as well that there really was some, something here to this framework. Uh, and I've used it a lot in my career. So it's a, it's a good way to prioritize. And really, again, to, to get the punchline, the more to the up, the closer it is to the upper left corner, the more underserved it is, basically. Right? That's the idea. So once we get clear on prioritizing those uh, based on how underserved they are, the next step is to get clear on our value proposition. Again, this is, okay, out of all the ideas we've been tossing around, which ones are we going to tell customers, hey, our product does this for you, and how are we going to be better than the competition? That's the general idea here. This is where product strategy lives. And so one thing I didn't mention is before I came out of Silicon Valley, I actually studied lean manufacturing and quality <coughs> in the industrial engineering program. I heard about the Kano model. Is anyone here familiar with the Kano model? Yeah. So I found this is a great way to apply to get clear on your value proposition. So let me explain the Kano model. It also talks about user needs and satisfaction. The way it works is on the horizontal axis, we're talking about how fully does a product meet the specific need that we're talking about. You know, if it's if it's saving time, you know, does it not save you any time at all, or does it? Well, it really does a great job of saving me time. And the next thing is on the y-axis is as a result of how much the product fulfills that need, how much user satisfaction or dissatisfaction is created. Now, if this seems a little complicated, the cool thing about the Kano models is it boils everything down into one of three categories of benefit or feature. The first is a performance benefit or feature. This is basically simple. The more the product fulfills this, the more customer value and satisfaction there is. The less it fulfills it, the less. So if we were in the microprocessor business and our chip was 10% faster than everybody else's, that's a performance benefit, right? Uh, the more is better, basically. Faster is better. Um, sticking with cars, if we stick with cars and we were shopping for a car, a new car, and we saw there were two cars, and they seemed pretty similar, but also when we realized one car has twice the miles per gallon the other car, then all our things being equal, we'd probably pick that car because, you know, fuel economy is a performance benefit for a car. So that's a performance benefit. The second one is a must-have. Now, having a must-have doesn't actually make anybody happy. That's what this graph is showing here. But not having the must-have makes customers unhappy. Right? So must-have, the other thing I should say since we have product managers here is, it's not what your executive says. We must have this feature. That's not what it must have. It must have. <laughs> People throw that word around way too much. But it, it literally means this when you, and there's a way to do the Kano survey where you ask people and you realize, hey, if we don't have it, they're going to be annoyed. And if we have it, it's not like they're going to be telling their friends about it. 
right? Sticking with cars, say I was in the market for a new car, I went to the showroom, I saw the car, I just loved the way it looked, you know, it was the right color of cherry red. Then I look at the spec sheet on the window and it's got all these amazing specs. But then I peek inside and I realize it doesn't have any seat belts. I, would be, I wouldn't buy it because I'd be afraid of dying or getting hurt, right? So seat belts are a must have for a car. But if car A has five seat belts, and car B has 100 seat belts, I don't say car B is 20 times better, right? Once you have one seat belt per person, you tap out, you're pretty much flat now. So that's must haves. The third category is delighters. So not having a delighter doesn't cause any problem because people aren't expecting to be there, but having a delighter can really create a lot of customer value. Also called like wow features, basically, right? Uh, not today, obviously, but sticking with cars, the first cars that had GPS navigation, it was a delighter, right? Before that, people were getting lost, or printing out Google Maps, right? Um, and then, you know, the first few cars that had GPS navigation built in, you just put in the address of where you're going, and it fundamentally changed how you got from point A to point B. But as we know, over time, more and more cars got GPS navigation. Garmin and TomTom Tom came out with their add-ons, and now we all just use our phones, right? So this is not a static picture when you see these opportunities. They, the needs and features migrate over time. So that yesterday's delighters become today's performance benefits, become tomorrow's must-haves. And the pace with which that happens just depends on the level of innovation and competition in your space. But the idea is we want to use these three categories as we think about our benefits, must-haves, performance, and delighters, to get clear on which ones are we going to provide and how are we going to be better than the competitors. And the way you put this to use to get clear on your product strategy or your value prop is, I've kept it generic here, but you basically look, create a table and you list one per row each of the must-haves that are important for your category, each of the performance benefits that are important for your category, each of the delighters. The second step is you create a column for each of your competitors, each of your key competitors. You don't want to have like 20 columns, but you can have you know, three, four, five, six, whatever. Um, and you want to, and a column for your own product, right? The next thing we want to do is score our competitors on this. And if it's, you know, if we're in the microprocessor business, we can put 2.1 gigahertz versus 1.9 gigahertz. If you can get quantitative, great. But even if you just use high, medium, low, that's fine too, right? It just needs to make sense as you look across the row. So let's say that you know this is our product. We're trying to figure out our value prop. Competitor A, they both have they both have the must have, of course. <coughs> Competitor A is the best at performance benefit one. Competitor B is the best at performance benefit two. They're both so so performance benefit three. And competitor A has this delighter. Okay? This is the backdrop upon which we want to decide how we're going to be better or different. Right? We want to come out with a me too product. You don't compete on must haves. You just have to have the must haves, right? So we've got to figure out where are we going to outperform or out delight. That's the key point of this exercise. And we can't say hi, 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 hi. Right? We don't have resources for it, probably. <coughs> um, and it's funny, I've run workshops, and you know, some teams come up with two highs, and some teams go up with five highs, and they just can't help themselves. You know? But one of my favorite definitions of strategy is it means saying no. And it's actually Steve Jobs' quote in the book and things like that about it. But basically, uh, it means saying no to something. Right? Not if you just say, yep, we're going to be the best at that and that and that and that, that. It's just not a clear positioning. It's not realistic. Right? So given this backdrop, we might go with something like this. Of course, we're going to have the must-have. We're going to deliver somewhat on performance benefit one, but we're not going to try to be the best. Uh, we're actually going to say no and not worry about this one too much, performance benefit two. Uh, what we're going to do is try to be the best performance benefit three. Maybe we found some segment that really values that benefit, or maybe we have some technology ideas as to how our solution can deliver higher levels of satisfaction. And then we have our own idea for a, a delighter. Right? What matters the most is what's called your unique differentiators. It's the performance benefit or benefits where you're going to outperform, where you're going to say, we're going to be the best, and your unique delighters. Right? That's, that's what really matters. The whole point of this exercise is to figure out what's our special sauce and how we're going to be better right, um, than this. And, if, and the funny thing is when you start to look through the k model lens of delighters and performance benefits, you find that a lot of the companies that are the top products in their category is because they're out clearly outperforming on one dimension and they have a delighter. So it's, you don't have to have a delighter, you just need to out, at a minimum you need to outperform, right? But if you have a delighter, it's a very powerful combo. Let's talk about an example um, to make it real. Has anyone here used Instagram? Mm -hmm. Heard of it? Yeah? Cool. I picked these examples because they're popular. So not today, forget about today, but think when Instagram came out, there were already a lot of other photo sharing apps that were already out there, remember? There were, there were a ton, like over 30. And then all of a sudden Instagram comes out and it quickly becomes number one. Why is that? Well, let's look at it through the Kano model lens. How did they outperform other people or how did they out delight other people? What were some of the things that you guys, just throw some answers out. Filters. Filters, okay, great, awesome. Filters, are they a solution or a problem? Solution. They're a solution. So now let's use the why. Why? What, what value does it create as a customer? 
filters look better. For the makes your people. pictures look better, right? Exactly. So that now we just, that's the right. I agree. They make your pictures look better. Filters is one way. There's actually another. That's the big way. There's also one other smaller, more subtle way. Yeah. Square. Square aspect ratio. When it first came out, people were kind of annoyed by this. Like, dude, why why are you cropping my why why can't I have the square pictures? So for those of you who don't remember, they had they made the aspect ratio square. Before that, and even today on your phone, when you take a picture, it can be landscape or it can be portrait. Well, when you put those in a feed and you mix them up, then they get shrunk. But when they're square, you don't have to shrink anything at all. So yes, those two features support the benefit, makes my pictures look better. That's great. And I, are those, you, would you call those performance or delighters? I call them delighters too. Great. So we got the delighter checked. What's the outperform? How do they outperform the other apps? And what kind of performance dimension could we say they? I thought the user experience was better. Okay, cool. Easier to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other thoughts on mobile. that? Huh? Mobile. So mobile, yeah. A lot of them were mobile. The, a lot of the other ones were mobile. Huh? Cloud. Cloud, okay. Yeah. Something we can measure. They outperformed on something that we can measure. And it's kind of related to easier to use. Time. Huh? Saving time. Saving time. That's right. Which is money for you. Yeah, right. Yeah. But exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yes, it saves time. They did this little hack. I'm sure they had great network, you know, back end and compression and all this jazz. Some legit tech chops as to why. But the key was this clever UX hack that they did. At the time, back then, you know, the uh, whatever G networks we were using weren't that fast, right? So it actually took a little while to upload your picture. Every other app. After you took the picture, it would sit there, and there was an upload button, and they would wait for you to push the upload button. <laughs> These guys said, you know what? People pretty much always upload the picture. Let's just start uploading it in the background the second we take it. And then by the time you push the button, it just takes like two seconds less. You're like, whoa, how did they do that? So that was it. Exactly. They outperformed on how long does it take. So let's recast this into a Kano uh, value prop thing here, right? So here we've got other photo sharing apps, Instagram. Must have, we didn't say this, but let me share my photos. That's the must have, right? You can't be in the photo sharing category if you don't do that. Performance, post my photos quickly. And because of that hack and, and the good compression and network performance they had, they were better. And then down here, make my photos look good as supported by filters and square aspect. That was a little lighter. These other guys didn't have it, they had it. And so I think if I had a reverse engineer and why did Instagram become so successful, it's because they clearly outperformed and they clearly had a nice delighter that made the pictures look better. And as you know, over time, more and more, they're not the only ones that fill these anymore. Huh? Thanks a billion. Yeah. Cool. So the next step, once we get clear, and that's why we want to get clear on that value prop going into our MVP. If we do an MVP that doesn't have our special sauce, what the heck are we testing? Right? We're testing must have, so it's not going to work out. We've got to see if those, the value prop hypothesis we have resonates with people or not. That's where MVP comes in. This is probably the most contentious term from Lean Startup stuff. Um, and there's really just two, I don't have time to get into a lot. In, in the book, I talk about how to break things down so that you're only building the minimum part. But there's two mistakes that I see people make with MVP that I like to cover. One is, even though the whole point of an MVP is to not do things the old way and like write some big PRD and send 20 developers into a cave for 18 months and have them come out and launch a product and realize nobody wants it, right? The whole point is to keep your scope small before you realize you completely messed it up, right? People still overscope their MVP. And it goes something like this. Yeah, I know, I know about MVP, but I, you know, there's feature. Cus some customer's going to want this, and we better put it in. And someone else goes, yeah, some customer's going to want this other thing. You get the slippery slope. Next thing you know, you've got a bloated MVP all over again. So it's really tough. But that's the number one mistake I see people make. The second mistake I see people make with MVP, I like to explain with this framework. Um, it's another pyramid uh, where we talk about how functional is a product, how reliable is a product, how usable is a product, how delightful is a product. Uh, are any of you familiar with MailChimp? I remember when I first used it, it was like so delightful, right? The user experience was so good and easy to use. Aaron Walters was the head of UX design for MailChimp. So it's not surprising that he wrote this book, Designing for Emotion. And the whole point of his book in this framework is to elevate the discussion from usability to delight, right? About 15 years ago, everybody should have gotten the memo that, hey, your products need to be easy to use, right? Usability answers the question, can people use it? Delight answers the question, do people want to use it? How do they feel when they use it? And that bar is getting raised, especially in the consumer space, right? But the idea is we, we can paint in, obviously we're doing an MVP, we can't color in the whole thing with our V1. It's not going to be full functionality, full reliability, full delight, full usability, right? But what, and so I see people saying, yep, I know we can't eat the whole elephant in one bite, we're going to do MVP, we're going to do this. So they do a subset of functionality with their MVP, which is what you want to do, you don't want to build everything. But they use MVP as an excuse to say, it's okay if it's buggy, it's just an MVP. It's okay, yeah, we'll do the UX design later, it's okay if it's hard to use, it's an MVP. 
<coughs> how do you think these MVPs do when you test them with customers? They don't do well. It doesn't matter if you're the world's best algorithm. If people can't find it or can't figure out how to use it or it doesn't work when they, the way they want it to, it's not going to matter, right? So it's true that you want to build a slice, but you want the slice that you build to be more like this. And I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, right? Obviously, it's not going to be completely bug-free and you know completely delightful. But for the, for the value prop that you're trying to test, for the subset of your MVP functionality, make sure it's reliable enough <coughs> and easy enough to use and delightful enough so you get a true test of whether that resonates, whether your value prop resonates with people or not. All right, once we get clear on our MVP, then we're going to create our prototype or work through our, we have to work through the UX design anyway. Uh, might as well create a prototype we can test with people. I don't have time to get into that today or uh, in this talk. This afternoon, I propose to talk all about UX design, but we'll get into that if, if we have that session. And then finally, we want to test our MVP with customers. Again, whether it's live product or a prototype, again, we're going step six. This is where we go and we see how we're doing. I just want to close out with a quick case study, end-to-end uh, -end case study. Uh, MarketingReport.com was the example. Um, my client was a CEO of a startup. They had an existing product, and he had an idea for a new product. Small team, me, um, the CEO, his VP of marketing, and a designer, and he wanted to see if there's a business opportunity there. And he had very limited dev resources. He said, okay, we can't do any dev, no coding. I said, great, we'll use prototypes. The idea was a marketing report. Um, does anyone here get junk mail? Yeah, three people. Uh, so the nice way to say it is direct mail. It's a euphemism for junk mail, basically. But the idea is, like, say I come home today and I get a coupon for cat litter in the mail. Why did I get that coupon? Well, it's because in some marketing database in the cloud somewhere, it thinks Dan Olsen has a cat, right? And the idea was to try to empower people, provide transparency into why you're getting the mail so you can maybe fix it. The, the CEO had worked in the credit industry before, so if you think about it, not today. Today, you can see what's going on with your credit score, your report, you can fix things. But like 30 years ago, you'd apply for a loan or a credit card, you put in your social, it'd go off into some black box and come back and say approved or declined, and you would have no idea. So the whole idea was to provide that kind of transparency that happened in the credit industry to kind of the marketing mail industry. I said, great. Uh, step one, target customer. You all raised your hand. Everybody in the U.S. that gets junk mail, that was our target customer, broad customer offering. The next thing was, great, let's get clear on what our hypotheses about customer needs are. So problem space, the top idea was, hey, learn why I received the junk mail I received, right? That's what we're going to help people with. Is so that why did I get a cat litter coupon and I can fix it basically, right? That was the problem. The top feature ideas was a marketing report, which consisted of a marketing profile that had all the information, like Dan has a cat, Dan married, Dan has two kids, and a marketing score, which was going to be like a credit score, we're higher, is better. So that was the core idea. And then one of the executives, <coughs> said, you know what, I also want to test the idea of money-saving offers. What if you can say, hey, I don't have a cat, but I have a dog. Can I opt in for dog coupons? And maybe you send me a dog coupon that I would find valuable. So opting in for money-saving offers. He had a hypothesis that people want to compare their spending to others, people. And then finally, uh, social networking. Pure solution space, jam it in there just because, you know, he thought it was a hot thing at the time. The other executive didn't care about these. He cared about the green stuff primarily. And then secondarily, he said, hey, you know, what if we just test the general idea of, hey, we're going to reduce your junk mail. And then we brainstorm a secondary benefit of, well, if we're saving all this paper, maybe we can say we're saving trees, some kind of green method. So I iterated with them to get to this point. I said, okay, is everybody's ideas on the board? They said, yes. So I said, great, let me look at this and try to come up with an MVP. I said, this is too big for a single MVP. So what we actually did is we created two MVPs. We took the core green ideas plus the yellow and called that the marketing shield because it was shielding you from junk mail. And then I created a separate MVP with this set of functionality. Again, the core green, because that was what the core idea was, with these three blues. So I created, that was the two different MVP functionalities, and then we created two different MVP UX design prototypes. Um, this obviously was the exact same UI. Uh, here's an example of what we did. This is like the landing page. I would call it medium fidelity. I mean, we didn't actually obsess about every pixel, but we you know, put a little bit of design in there. And then when you clicked in, you got to this main page. And this is how we didn't have to do double the work. We just kind of mixed and matched these modules, depending on which, one, which concept you were in. And the idea was each feature had like this box that described it at a high level. And when you clicked a little more, you went to the page where you actually engaged with that feature. So it was like a prototype of about eight or nine pages for each of the concepts. I ran, it, uh, I ran the prototypes with, with users. What did we learn? Here's the same diagram, now color-coded, red, yellow, green. There were actually a lot of questions and concerns uh, green doesn't mean, oh yeah, we're, we're good. Green meant there were a lot, even though there are a lot of questions and concerns, we think we understand a good handle on them and we can address them. And if we address them, we think there's an opportunity to create customer value there. Yellow meant they were lukewarm on it. Red meant they hated it or didn't understand it at all, right? So the first thing is, did you get any green? Did we get any green? There's no guarantee, especially the first time that you get any green. So we got some green, so that's good. We got green here for saver and green here for shield. So that was good. The second thing is, did we get any green in the core idea? 
Remember, this was the core idea. Did we get any green? Like, thank goodness we tested something else, right? This happens all the time, right? People go out with, to talk to customers about a certain idea, and they go, well, actually, that's not that important. But let me tell you about this other thing. It's an adjacent thing that is, right? Flickr didn't start out as a photo site. It started out as a game development company, right? Slack did, too. Right? Slack didn't start out to make the world's best message platform. They actually were both started by the same guy, Stuart. They say he's like the world's richest, baddest game designer, basically, out there. <laughs> but that's the idea, right? And I, so the whole point is to get out there. Don't, don't obsess too long. Get out there with some initial hypothesis and talk to customers because they will guide you. If you do the methodology right, they will guide you to where they're going to create more value. Um, the other thing is, you know, I was just as proud of the red. Red means, hey, this is horrible. People don't want it. Let's not wait. That's, how, that's a low important stuff. That's how you avoid the waste, right? Do you guys know what a marketing score is? Who knows that? I don't either. I worked on the project. Nobody knows what it is, right? So it's like, great. But you know what? We, I know it would have taken a lot of engineering time and effort. I know it would have took an expensive third-party data license we didn't have. I know it would take a lot of money to educate customers. But because people don't want it, we can trim the fat. So then we you know, hear people say, you got to pivot. So we started here. And you got to pivot there. We got to pivot there. We decided to pivot there for three reasons. One, they already had an existing product. And that was more consistent with their brand. Secondly. They were um, money-saving offers. We have to sign up a bunch of biz dev deals and partnerships. It would have taken a lot of time, extend the time to market. And third, there were already people doing this, and we didn't have a good thing on how we were going to be different or better. Back to the value prop. I'm going to throw questions to the end. We're almost done here, guys. So we pivoted. And because we did prototypes, there was no qualms about just throwing it out the window and starting with a blank piece of paper. It wasn't, oh, well, we already built the database for this, and we have the API calls. We have to reuse these things. Like None of that stuff, right? So we threw away uh, marketboard.com and pivoted to junk mail freeze. Here's the new mock-up. And uh, we learned all kinds of things. This is what happens about peeling the onion when you talk to customers. You know, back here we just said, hey, reduce junk mail. I learned that not all junk mail is the same. Some junk mail is kind of annoying, like the little coupons you get in the weekend thing. Uh, some is really annoying and really makes people mad. And I found out that it's the financial related stuff. Cash advance checks, pre-approved credit card offers. And I asked people why. They said, well, I live at a house. My mailbox isn't locked. I'm worried that while I'm at the office, I'm worried someone could reach in there and grab it and take money from my account or you know, take identity theft or anything like that. So when we learned that, we put that front and center. Second time around, second set of research, people were like, you can see them looking and nodding and getting angry just thinking about it. Right? Other things I learned when you talk to people. One was basically... I said, tell me what happens when you, you, you get your mail. Like, let me tell you what happens. And they said, I go to the mailbox, I get my stack of mail, I go straight to my paper shredder, I go shred, 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 shred. <laughs> Did anyone here do that? I didn't do that, so I didn't know about it. That's what happens when you talk to customers. You learn so many things. So there was a whole, sa I'm like, wow, how much time do you spend? They say five minutes a day. I'm like, well, the mail comes six days a week. That's 30 minutes a week. That's 1,500 minutes a year. That's money for you, man. That's in your pocket. <laughs> so, but we didn't have any save time. We didn't have any. We missed a whole save time benefit. So then we found there's a save, spend less time shredding mail, right? We added that in. We learned in the problem space. Other silly things. We said save trees. Multiple people said, how many trees are you going to save? So we put 43 trees in there. The second time around, they're like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> and I didn't mention this, but both times we said, hey, would you pay 10 bucks a month for this service? And the first time around, there's nobody was having anything of it. Second time around, and it's always iffy to ask people if they pay if they don't have to pay, not to bust out their wallet. Second time around, they said, well, what I, need, I need a 30-day trial. But if your product does what it says here, I would gladly pay you 10 bucks a month. So there was a night and day difference. And then the final thing was, after all the tests were done, I'm like, great, thank you, Ron. Thanks for your time. Here's the check for $100 for, for the 45 minutes you spent with us. Almost every single person second time was like, after, they were free and clear to go. They were like, so is this product live now? Can I go use this thing? Like, no, we're still building it. They're like, can I give you my email? Can you email me when this goes live? So that was like a big kind of non-test evidence. So I was pretty excited about the product. <laughs> All right, so to close out, lean product process again. Start out with getting clear on your customer. Use importance and satisfaction to figure out what their underserved needs are. Kano model for your value prop. Um, don't overbuild. You know, figure out what that MVP is. Create a prototype. Test it. And go through that loop that I mentioned, the iterative loop with the goal of improving product market fit. I mentioned that I run a monthly uh, speaker series down in Mountain View, uh, up in Mountain View, I guess, from where we are, at Intuit. And the next one we have is on Thursday, April 19th. It's a very talented woman. She's done the best job I've seen of anybody explaining design for non-designers. And as I mentioned for PMs, I think it's helpful. I don't expect PMs to be designers or be the world's best designers, but it really helps a lot. She wrote this great book, How Well Love Design. I just saw her talk, and I said, that's a great talk on how to, how to explain design. So. Um, I would recommend you just go to meetup.com, lean product. You can join the meetup group, group for free. Our events cost 20 bucks each. We have dinner, and, you know, nice dinner, and we have speakers. 
Um, I'm also at Mayshaw, I'm a consultant. I recently have grown my practice to add some other consultants. So if you or anyone you know is like, hey, maybe we could use some help on the PM. If you're not, that's cool. But if you have uh, and you want to talk about, hey, how might we be able to help, I'm happy to chat with you guys. You heard Brendan mention that they want to get feedback on the, on the speaker. So if you want to go to the survey URL and leave feedback, that'd be great. You also, I'm, I'm happy to hear feedback directly too. Um, and then, you know, here's the places you can get hold of me, you know, Dan Olson on Twitter, danolson.com, there's the meetup. Uh, happy to connect on LinkedIn, and I'll tweet out, you know, whoever, uh, I'll look at the tweets uh, during the break and, and tweet somebody, so just find me at the break. So, um, thanks for your patience. I'm happy to answer questions now that you guys have. Yeah? How, how soon can you talk to customers about the pricing? That's a tough thing, it's tough. Um, I mean, until you really have iterated to the point where you have something of value, you're not gonna really get good answers. Right. Um, there are some things you can try to do online. There's some tests online sometimes where you, you play games with Google Ads or something and then you go to different landing pages and you test different response rates and things like that. But pricing is one of these things where you, to really, really get a good answer, you really need to have a product in market and then do some experimentation and it gets back to segmentation. Like the lightweight users probably aren't going to pay as much as the power users. And so eventually you tier your product and think how you extract the most value you can think. So yeah, it's always helpful. The one thing I do not, don't say, how much would you pay for this? That's like a horrible question. People can't tell you. It's better to say, if this was 20 bucks a month, how likely would you be to buy it and have some kind of survey scale? You know what I mean? Yeah. And just have some point, otherwise people will be like, free if I can get it for free. People always, you know, they don't know. So the other thing you can do is benchmark comparable things. Like, oh, they're paying, they're paying like five bucks a month for Evernote and we're kind of like Evernote or something. You know what I mean? Like this feels like the right level. Yes. So Thanks for waiting. Is, and okay. No problem. Okay. And uh, if you can point me to material instead, that's okay too. But the question is a little broad. It's I've, I've actually tried this survey model, and my challenge becomes at some point there are multiple personas. Yeah, you don't always right. have one target market. Right. Like for Intuit, it was pen and paper, but also people that prepare taxes. So then when you're doing surveys, are you targeting all those personas? So, so the only survey that was in there was the one that had those 13 data points, and that's because we had thousands of users and we were asking a very specific question. So I'm not a, usually a big fan of surveys for this stuff, except for very specific use cases. There's a reason NPS is enough for motor score so popular, because it's like they guardrail you in. You always ask the question this way, and you always answer it this way. Um, I, a lot of it is qualitative research, but to the second part of your question, which is right on, is the way I get this question is, hey Dan, I interviewed 10 users and I got like four different answer patterns. To me, that means you haven't peeled the onion enough on your target customer. They're really not all the same right. yet, right? It's just like saying, hey, I talked to 10 millennials and only four of them want to cook food at home. Okay, well we didn't, you know, it, it, we didn't, so that's what it usually indicates. It's kind of like a laser beam. If you have coherence, if it's very clear, then you get coherent. It'll be a little bit of noise, but you'll get coherent answers more. And you can have, even within like facts, like even within, there's different people. There's the, at a high level, there's people that want to do it themselves. There's other people that say, you know what, I'm just going to delegate this to a CPA no matter what. What's a good, and I'm, I'm originally an engineer myself, so it's mm -hmm. hard for me, but uh, what's a good formula or something to say I measured enough people? Because uh -huh. sometimes you just, you, you, know, you can ask 10 people if you sure. need, you can ask 100, yeah. you need, but that doesn't matter. I mean, you got to be comfortable as an ex-engineer and someone who loves numbers and math and quant and statistics, you got to be comfortable with small sample sizes. I gave a talk one time in, in the late, and, and somebody said, well, how many customers did you talk to? I'm like, 10. She's like, 10? That's not statistically significant. I'm like, you're right. How many should I talk to? She's like, 1,000. I'm like, are you sure that's enough? She's like, 10,000. I'm like, okay, how long would it take to do 10,000 one-on-one customer interviews? Right. So it's, you just got to let go of this chi-square statistics mentality. It's great later on, but it's not like that in the beginning. If I talk, if I show my prototype to 10 users and eight of them can't figure out how to log in, do I go, I better talk to 1,000 more to see if there's a real problem here. Right? Or conversely, if, you know what I mean? So it's just about patterns. And you, in the book, I didn't have time to get into it. Like, simple ways to create percentages from these samples. And what you want to do is see progress from wave to wave. That's all. So. Yeah. I just want to add to your answer. Yeah. Uh, to me, the answer to that question is a very engineering answer. The <laughs> incremental learning is less than the relative effort it takes. Is what? Yeah, I don't think they heard the last part. Incremental learning is? Less than the effort it takes. Ah, there you go. Cool. Yeah. So if you yeah. learn something yeah. from the 11th person, that is not 
that you've already learned from the first sure. step. What's the point in doing it? Well? Yeah, and I recommend doing waves because you're going to take your learnings, pattern match, and address them and iterate and then test with a new wave of people. So once you have enough signals to be like, all right, we clearly need to fix the registration. Nobody can figure out how to do it. Just stop testing, fix it, right? Um, and then you can go take the next group of people. Yeah. yeah. Did you think about testing those ideas in the, in the last example on the other side with advertisers? As opposed to the uh, the people that get the get the ads. Uh, no, because we were trying to market it to the people that received the mail. Yeah, so we th there you could didn't be challenge that at all. No, we didn't. We didn't. I mean, then that's the thing I, I didn't mention is like especially in B two B, you might have more than one customer you need to be in mind. Customers using the broadest sense. So you may have the end user and you may have the buyer, and or or in a two sided market like Uber, Airbnb, you have drivers and riders, hosts and guests. When you have more than one, you need to do a pyramid for each one. So if, if, in, if in the case we decide, hey, we're going to go after customers and we're going to go after the mailers or advertisers, we'd have to build up a persona and figure out what are their underserved needs and do that. So we'll be focused on this target market. But that's what we would do if we got more than one. Go for it. Fantastic. You're free to go. Thank you. Free to stay. Yeah.